So thank you everyone for joining us online um, from you know, different time zones. Um, this is actually um, um, a very important event um, for us. Uh, this is the um, second season. We are launching the second season of um, Global Minds for Ukraine. Global Minds for Ukraine is a project which we started at Kiev School of Economics uh, during the first days of the full-scale uh, Russian invasion. Uh, despite the um, shock and despite all the difficulties during the war and during the invasion, we felt that we are obliged to keep doing uh, our job as academics. We want to share knowledge, to discuss knowledge, uh, to enlighten our students and our audiences and to discuss difficult questions of, uh, um, of how societies exist, coexist with each other, how they develop, uh, the nature of uh, democracy and economic uh, processes. And we were very blessed and lucky to invite um, leading intellectuals from uh, different countries, uh, scholars, historians, economists, economists, political scientists, uh, journalists, uh, ambassadors, and military experts uh, to share this knowledge with our audience. Um, and this was a fast, fascinating journey for us, and we learned a lot, and we also engaged a lot of uh, fantastic speakers. Um, then, after a little break, we realized that you know, we, we are hungry for more, we want to have more lectures, so we decided to reopen this project and have the second season of Global Minds for Ukraine, and we are very honored and very lucky uh, to have uh, Susan Stokes as our first uh, speaker to, you know, to give us this honor and to give her a uh, lecture, and uh, interestingly, <laughs> Susan was on our list for many months. We, she was, um, on our wish list for a very long time and finally we uh, we managed to uh, to have her here with us today um susan stokes is a is a very famous uh, political scientist she has a huge resume of her scientific achievements and positions uh her current title is a tiffany and margaret blake distinguished service professor and she's a director of the chicago center of democracy she has published many books and papers on the nature of democracy, history of democracy, uh, development of democratic processes, but also uh, democratic participation, elections, uh, protests uh, around the world. So, um, and today uh, I hope she can give us uh, and to our Ukrainian audience very interesting uh, lecture about her field. So Susan, thank you so much for um, you know, spending this hour with us on your free time. And whenever you're ready, you can share the screen and um, introduce the slides. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Timofi. It is just such a such a pleasure and such an honor to to be here. Um, I, you know, it's it's really inspiring for academics. It's been inspiring for academics around the world to see you folks, um, the the Kiev School of Economics, keeping your activities going during this extremely difficult, obviously just just uh, heartbreaking and 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 terrifying time. Um, so, um, you know, so what an honor to be to be able to speak to to this group to this audience. Um, I'm going to share my screen in a, in a minute. I just wanted to mention before I get started that the research that I'm reporting on, which is um, the one of the main research streams that we have at the Chicago Center on Democracy, um, draws builds very much on a, a very lively area of research in political science and in uh, in political economy, and also just more directly, my own work is drawing on um, drawing on collaborations and also on the work of some um, really exciting young scholars. And I just wanted to mention them by name before I get started. So um, Melis Labens is a recent Yale PhD um, who wrote a wonderful dissertation on democratic erosion. And she is now a postdoctoral scholar at Oxford University. Um, and I um, have collaborating with um, Eli Rao, who's another uh, recent Yale PhD, currently a postdoc at Vanderbilt. The, all the figures that you're going to see are not just created by by Eli, but but really con conceived of by him. So he's a he's very much part of this research 
project. Um, I'm also not going to talk directly too much about another aspect of the research um, that is a kind of um, systematic analysis of the rhetoric of, um, of aspiring autocrats around the world. That's work that I'm conducting to, uh, jointly with two um, current University of Chicago PhD students, Ipek Chinar and Andres Uribe. So I just wanted to mention those folks um, before getting started. <clears throat> Okay. My talk today focuses on a phenomenon that political scientists refer to as democratic erosion or uh, democratic backsliding. And this is basically when presidents or prime ministers come to office through free and fair elections and then usually pretty quickly start undermining the very institutions of democracy um, which have brought them to power. Um, I'm going to show evidence that in the 21st century, backsliding is displacing military coup d'etats as the chief threat to democracy around the world. In fact, the world is experiencing a wave of democratic erosion. Um, and I'm going to offer an expl explanation for this wave or for this phenomenon of, de of democratic erosion. Um, I think that the topic, the importance of the topic is fairly self-evident. If we're going to defend democracy, um, we need to understand the forces that threaten it. Um, but, bef but here before a, a Ukrainian audience, I'm just going to add an additional justification for this study. So democratic peace theory teaches us that war is, is less likely between two democracies. When one country is an autocracy and another is a democracy, they're more likely to go to war with one another, other things being equal. Russia's war against Ukraine has obviously many causes, but certainly authoritarianism in Putin's Russia juxtaposed to Ukraine, which is strengthening its, its democracy, is one of those reasons. So um, shoring up democracy is a peacemaking project as well as a project to allow more citizens of more countries to exercise self-government. Um, so what you can see here in the slide is, um, these are um, coming from data from uh, the organization Varieties of Democracy. Um, and these are um, an, an index of the sort of quality or level of democracy over time since, since 1990. And what you see here is that the high point of sort of some promise of democracy in, uh, in Russia came in 1995 and then declined very sharply. Today, Russia is considered by experts around the world as a consolidated autocracy. Re Ukrainian democracy improved by the same varieties of democracy measure after 2000, then declined during the presidency of Viktor Yanukovych, and I'm going to ask you to excuse my terrible pronunciation, um, but it improved later. Um, so, uh, so today, obviously, uh, Ukraine is far more democratic than Russia. <clears throat> Let me turn to the causes of some of these regime dynamics. If you follow the scholarship on the political economy of democracy and dictatorship over the last few decades, you'll be familiar with arguments that center around income inequality. Income inequality is viewed as a driver of autocracy and of democratic instability. There are several versions of this argument due to scholars like James Robinson and Daron Achemoglu, um, and Carlos Boisch, and in an earlier era to Seymour Martin Lipset. In contemporary models, the democracy is an institution, it's conceptualized as an institution that gives the median voter the power to set the tax rate. When inequality is high, and the median voter therefore is relatively poor, under democracy, the median voter will favor a high level of taxation and extract significant resources from the wealthy. Therefore, under high levels of inequality, um, the wealthy have a preference against democracy. Um, they don't want to cede decision-making power to a relatively poor median voter. <clears throat> so um, kind of in the old model, um, when income inequality is high, the wealthy favor autocracy and res resist democratization and use military power to topple democratic regimes and to support autocratic ones. So that's the old model of democratic instability in an era of military coups. Does this model have any relevance for explaining democratic erosion? I'd like to suggest that it does. 
Consider a world in which income inequality is high. In fact, it has grown in many parts of the world, including in most OECD countries over the past half century. And a world in which democracy is not easily shed. And there are um, reasons why countries uh, prefer to be democracies and, um, and, and prefer to be able to, to call themselves democracies even when, when, that, that when the, the, the true nature of democracy runs kind of thin. Um, so there are benefits to a country for being able to call itself a democracy. Income inequality creates discord in the electorate, a sense of resentment of having been left behind by economic growth. Among the elite, there is resistance to heavily redistributive measures, which are costly to them. The situation opens up space for right-wing populists, political leaders who play to the constituent sense of resentment for having been left behind. But these populist leaders translate this resentment not into a redistributive agenda, but into a non-class idiom of polarization around other cleavages other than social class. <clears throat> so um, the, uh, what I'm sketching here, what I'm suggesting is a, a new model of democratic instability for a period of democratic erosion. Income inequality creates discord in the electorate, a sense of resentment of having been left behind. Elites are resistant to deep redistribution and space opens up for right-wing populists, leaders who play to constituent sense of resentment, but translate this resentment into non-redistributive policies and rhetoric. So <clears throat> I'm suggesting a kind of um, a, a kind of uh, set of, of of causal links, starting with income inequality, which encourages populism, and then I'll argue that populism encourages democratic erosion. So why would this be? Why does populism lead to democratic erosion? So first, what do we mean by populism? This is a term that gets thrown around a lot, and not necessarily always meaning the same thing. Um, so I'm drawing on um, contemporary political theorists um, and observers who identify populism with political parties <clears throat> and movements that deploy a rhetoric and extol political worldview that combines anti-elitism and the elite, the, a, a kind of worldview that, that has the elite as um, in opposition to the people or the nation, and a kind of Manichae Manichaean worldview in which the world is divided into forces of good and evil. So it's not so much a politics of policy debates of differences over public policy. It's a politics of um, identities and, and, and forces that represent sort of absolute good and absolute evil. Um, one contemporary political theorist who's uh, done a lot of really interesting work on populism is um, Jan Werner Mueller, um, who's written that populism is a way of perceiving the political world that sets a morally pure and fully unified people against elites who are deemed corrupt or in some other way morally inferior. Um, and he also stresses Manichaeanism, a sort of div div a, a, a mindset that divides the world into good and evil. <clears throat> So um, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to offer some empirical support for this new model that I'm presenting, um, a model that goes from income inequality under democracy to populism and to democratic erosion. <clears throat> um, so first, I suggested to you I suggested a moment ago that democratic erosion is sort of the new form of democratic instability um, that we're experiencing, that we've been experiencing in the 21st century. Um, and um, you know, the, the, the metaphor of the wave has frequently been induced uh, or, or has been, been referred to in, um, in discussions of regime dynamics. We had the third wave of democratization and so forth in, in the 20th century. Um, here you can see uh, this is the percentage of democracies experiencing erosion. And it certainly has that kind of wave-like structure. So um, very few 
um, uh, kind of negligible numbers in the uh, before the before the year 2000, and then a kind of growing wave of democratic erosion, never affecting more than you know even 10 percent of the democracies around the world, but still um, quite becoming much more important um, as we move to, to into the, the the second decade of the of the 21st century. Um, now in this figure. <clears throat> Um, this is a, a, a kind of more evidence that there's a sense in which um, the coup d'etat is phasing out as the source of democratic instability or threats to democracy and democratic erosion from within is sort of uh, taking its place in a sense. Um, so this, in this figure, coups are de demarcated in, in, uh, in black, um, erosion events are demarcated in blue. Um, so you see that as coups are subsiding, uh, backsliding has sort of taken off. <clears throat> um, here is a, a slide that gives you sort of more of a, of a sense of what kinds of countries we're talking about when we talk about democratic erosion. And here I want to emphasize that I'm drawing very heavily on the really excellent work of Amelis Lebe. Um, Labens, who uh, uh, work that she began as a PhD student um, at Yale and, and is now um, developed into a book manuscript. I expect to see a book um, in the next uh, year, year and a half or so out of her excellent work. Um, Melis has sort of uh, um, uh, uh, pioneered a, a method for kind of deciding how to code countries, democracies into eroding and non-eroding um, cases. Um, and she makes really interesting use of the sort of theories of accountability, both horizontal accountability, meaning um, governments being able to be held to account by legislatures and presidential systems and by ju the, uh, judiciaries, um, and, um, and vertical uh, accountability, meaning the ability of electorates and the press to hold governments to account. Um, when uh, in, in Melissa's system, um, and again, drawing often very heavily on VDEM, on varieties of democracy data, <clears throat> um, a country that under that experiences a significant decline in um, indexes, both of um, horizontal and vertical accountability over a five year period, and, and that's among countries that have experienced a, a, a turnover of power, so they count as democracies, um, those countries that are coded as, um, as eroding countries. Um, so you can see here that <clears throat> Some of the new democracies, some of the countries that have experienced democratic erosion are new democracies in poor regions of the wor world, places that, w that we might have expected to, the kinds of places that we would have expected to experience some democratic instability um, uh, in, in earlier, earlier periods, um, countries like Benin, Senegal, the Philippines, and Com Comoros. Um, but there are other wealthy, relatively wealthy countries and, and kind of regionally important countries that also have experienced democratic erosion. Um, countries like Turkey, uh, Poland, Mexico, Hungary, Brazil, and the United States. So here I'm starting to get into um, potential sort of causes of democratic erosion. And we're, what we're looking at here, and by the way, we're well into the part of my presentation where I'm drawing very heavily on uh, collaborative work with Eli Rao, as I mentioned earlier, and beautiful slides, beautiful figures put together by Eli. Um, here, what we're looking at is the average logged GDP per capita by year for countries that experienced erosion, and those are the black triangles and countries that did not. And those are the gray squares. So what you can see is that until 2000, um, th they're actually um, uh, countries that, are, that have higher than average per capita GDP that are experiencing democratic erosion. Um, as we get into the 21st century, when democratic erosion becomes a more frequent phenomenon, um, the, 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 there are really kind of middle and upper income countries, relatively speaking, the average um, income per capita of countries experiencing democratic erosion um, is kind of falls into the middle and upper income um, uh, parts of the spectrum. Here, um, I'm looking at a similar kind of look, but now we're looking at Gini. Um, so um, keep in mind that Gini coefficients, which are um, uh, scores that measured income distribution 
uh, far from perfect, the economists in the audience will know these are these are not perfect, but they probably are highly correlated to the things that we're interested in, income inequality, wealth inequality in countries. And keep in mind that the higher the Gini score, the more unequal a country's income distribution is. Um, and um, what we're, what you can see here is that um, throughout the Gini is the average Gini of eroding countries is higher. So these are more unequal countries um, than uh, among democracies um, that didn't experience democratic erosion. So highly suggestive evidence that um, income that that income inequality is at least associated in some way with democratic erosion. Um, so we also, this is sort of initial research that um, that Eli Rao and I are, are undertaking, but it's there's some indication that there may actually be an interactive effect between income per capita and Gini in um, in the dynamics of democratic erosion. Um, so this figure um, is showing us the um, the the percent the Gini um, measures in percentile terms, um, so sort of where countries are in relative terms that have on, on, that have experienced erosion relative to the full set of democracies in terms of Gini, and that's the vertical axis. The horizontal axis is GDP per capita, um, again percentiles. Um, and so what this figure shows is. Um, and this is the 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 the, the Gini figures um, in the first year that a country experienced democratic erosion. Gini doesn't tend to move all that quickly. Um, so what the figure is suggesting is that both low, middle, all low, middle, and high income countries have experienced erosion. So there's not a, a clear clus clustering in, along the the horizon horizontal dimension, but almost no low Gini countries experience democratic erosion. Um, Poland and Hungary are um, outliers here. Um, all of the other countries that experienced uh, democratic erosion are ones with higher than average um, uh, Gini levels, higher than average inequality, um, and compared to other democracies, some of them very high inequality countries, Brazil being a, a case in point, um, very high levels of Gini, very unequal income distribution that uh, a country that has experienced um, uh, democratic erosion under a right-wing populist since 2018. Poland and Hungary, interesting outliers, um, countries obviously that came out of the, uh, the our, our post-communist countries, which typically have um, lower levels of, of income inequality. Um, it would be interesting to look at how changes in income inequality might uh, might have an effect on uh, on democratic erosion. Um, so here again is a figure. Um, that um, is based on a rare events logit analysis, and I'm going to stress that this is fa fairly preliminary work that we're that we're doing, um, and we're looking at the um, the impact of um, of GDP per capita on the probability of an of democratic erosion, um, and we're looking at that across different countries of different levels of Gini of of income inequality. So the white line there. Um, is low inequality countries, um, and the um, the red line is high inequality countries, um, and then you have the two other intermediate levels. Um, in low Gini, relatively equal countries, low income is or poverty um, is associated with a relatively elevated but still fairly low probability of democratic erosion. In unequal countries, as income rises. The probability of erosion grows substantially. So again, um, a strong association between apparently association between um, income inequality and um, and the probability of democratic erosion uh, with some interesting interactions, especially that that effect, especially pronounced among uh, among wealthier countries. Earlier, I drew a connection between income inequality and democratic erosion, um, and the link between the two was populism. In an era in which there are strong pressures to sustain democracy, at least an appearance of democracy, populists can mobilize electoral support while avoiding a strong program of income distribution. So it let me just say it's worth noting that not all democratic erosion occurs under the leadership of right-wing populists. We've also had left-wing populists who have who populists who have eroded 
um, uh, democracy and who have championed more dis redistributive measures. Um, but their anti-elitism and Manichaean postures can lead to polarization and to democratic erosion. Um, and I'm referring here to figures um, like Hugo Chavez in Venezuela and Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador in Mexico, among others. Um, and so I just kind of want to give a little bit of a sense of how to kind of sort out some of these different categories. Um, this is just a sort of a simple way um, in which, uh, and this is actually worked collaboratively with um, Andres Uribe and Ipec Chinar, who I mentioned the two PhD students at Chicago. Um, here we have a conceptual map that can sort of help sort out populists from non-populists, social democrats from left populists, and left wing from right, right wing populists. So what we're saying here is a first question about a political leader is, um, is, is, is she uh, uh, anti-elitist? If the answer is no, um, we, we could call her a conservative. If the answer is yes, we could call her um, um, a, a non-conservative. Then the next question is, does she um, deploy and promote a kind of Manichaean worldview, a kind of um, good versus evil, as opposed to a more policy-oriented worldview? If the answer is no, um, that person is we we can we can um, kind of characterize that person as a social democrat. Um, if the answer is yes, that person is a, is a, a populist. Um, and then the question is. Who is the enemy? Who is the target? The, who is the force of, of evil against whom this, um, this leader rails? Um, if that is an economic elite, then these sound like sort of traditional left-wing populists, um, of which we have many examples. The region that I have some expertise in, Latin America, this is a, this is a, a very old um, kind of, uh, kind of uh, role. Um, in fact, in the United States as well, we've had traditional sort of um, left oriented populists in our history. Um, if the answer is that, the, the, um, that rather than economic elites, um, the, the objects of, of ire are political elites and ethnic um, and other out groups, sort of identity groups, um, then we're calling these people right-wing populists. So returning to the right-wing populists, they engage in a polarizing anti-elitist discourse, but don't push typically for redistributive policies. They polarize other dimensions of difference besides social class. So what are the kinds of um, uh, cleavages that, they, that these right-wing populists um, polarize? Um, one is religion. Um, so just as an example, I'm sure many of these are familiar to, to some of you. Um, in India, uh, Nahendra Modi of the BJP, um, party, the sort of standard bearer of Hindu nationalism, has, um, uh, you know, has has found many ways to both rhetorically and in public policy um, uh, undertake a, a, a kind of a sustained campaign against Muslims, a kind of anti anti Muslim um, uh, kind of uh, diatribes and campaigns. In the quote here from just from just past June, he's um, the figure will be obscure to most of us, but he's. Um, he's invoking a 17th century Mughal emperor to sort of remind his um, his Hindu audience that um, you know of a long uh, long ago um, attack by a, 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 a Muslim leader um, against um, against Hindus, um, and then the more in the realm of public policy, the citizen citizenship amendment acts um, in of 2019 excluded Muslims from a list of persecuted religions um, that people of persecuted religions who could attain citizenship in um, in India. Uh, my former colleague Tariq Tachil, um, now at the University of Pennsylvania, has very brilliantly explained in his first book um, how the BJP under Modi stitched together a lower caste Hindu constituency to, with a kind of party elite um, that was um, very much opposed to redistributive policies. Another dimension of polarization by right-wing populists is partisanship. Um, so this is, you know, sort of in the realm of politics for politics sake. Um, but here, let me give an example from the um, discourse of Donald Trump from the United States. Um, this is a fairly typical statement from this, this one from his 2016 campaign when he was running against Hillary Clinton. Clinton is totally bought and paid for by Wall Street, the special interest, the lobbyists 100%, she's totally owned by Wall Street. So what's interesting here is that 
the kind of Wall Street, and these are tropes that are very familiar to a sort of uh, uh, in line with a history, a tradition of populism in the United States that that has since the 19th century railed against large corporate banking, uh, railroad interests, but in the discourse of Trump, this is kind of morphing very quickly into um, a kind of very harsh attack on his political opponent. Um, with um, so so the 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 anti corporate stance is really kind of a way into a very harsh diatribe, um, absolute vilification of his uh, his political opponent. And we we saw continue we see a continuation of that kind of vilification um, uh, right up to this day. Um, so um, the okay, and just to mention that is it is not not all the the, um, the, the kind of the the right wing populist who uh, vilifies others on non economic terms and then um, avoids redistributive policies. Um, Trump's great legislative accomplishment during his term in office was to pass a tax reform that was very, um, uh, very much favorable toward corporate and 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 very wealthy uh, corporate interests and very wealthy individuals. Um, another dimension of polarization by right wing populists is ethnicity. Um, and here, um, sort of a little closer to home for, for a Ukrainian audience, we have um, Viktor Orban, who um, is, uh, you know, has, there are many quotes that one could find of Orban um, talking about um, the, the sort of the Hungarian people in sort of a racialized and, and, uh, and Christianized sense. Um, Hungarians are not a mixed race. We do not want to become a mixed race either. Um, Orban has made frequent mention of Magyar and Christian identity of, um, of Hungarians. So this harkens back to this notion of the sort of the, the nation, the people um, who are morally and ethnically um, pure um, and against sort of dark forces of, of, uh, that are mounted presumably against them. Another dimension of politicization by right wing populists is xenophobia. Um, so, you know, there are many instances around the world, especially in countries that are recipients. So these are, again, wealthier countries that are recipients of, of, of immigrants, um, countries like uh, Serbia, Hungary, um, Great Britain. During, uh, you know, during the, the Brexit debate, there was a, a heavy anti-immigrant discourse, France. Um, uh, uh, under um, in the discourse of, of Marine Le Pen, um, but I'll return to our friend um, Donald Trump, who made this um, sort of famous statement as part of his campaign announcement when he announced that he was running for president. Actually, the announcement was in 2015. Um, he was talking about um, immigration from Mexico, and he said, "When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending." Um, you, they're not sending you, he's pointing to, to presumably good Mexicans in the audience, they're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with, he means with them, they're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some I assume are good people. So um, I want to pause for a moment over this formulation, because it also gives us some sense, some hints into the kind of political psychology that lies behind the power of the right-wing populist discourse. Notice the, the odd formulation that um, Mexico is sending us um, people, that immigration is a matter of a, of a government or a country sending its people to another country. Obviously, that, that's not the way most immigration works. Mostly my, international migration has to do with individual decentralized decisions by individuals and families. Um, but in Trump's formulation, um, it, somebody, some um, powerful force is sending bad Mexicans, presumably, to the United States. Um, so um, this is not a... a uh, an empty or, or insignificant sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of mental flaw of Trump's. He, he really sort of intuitively knows what he's doing with this kind of formulation. Um, he's never heard of cognitive appraisal theory, but that's what um, psychologists have developed to explain how you, people are um, are are moved very deeply and very um, and and um, and and kind of uh, uh, stung very sharply by certain kinds of framings of 
problems that they might face. So let me just, as a little bit of a digression here um, into cognitive appraisal theory. What does it say? Well, it, it says that there's something wrong in the world. Let's say there's a storm or there's, you know, really high temperatures. I think you might be suffering and, um, you know, probably the least of your concerns in Ukraine at the moment. Um, but if that, if that problem in the environment can be framed as caused by human agency, so it's some person or human actor who's caused the problem, and that human agency is intentional, so the person or force that's causing the problem is doing it on purpose, and better yet, the human agency is intended to hurt you or people like you, then that's a very powerful message that is likely to evoke anger and moral outrage. Anger and moral outrage are what psychologists call approach emotions, um, approach emotions um, also including um, uh, euphoria and, and enthusiasm, but anger is a, is a prime one. Approach emotions are things that get us to want to be around other people. We want to be in other people's faces. They're, they're high stimulus emotions. Um, you want to go out, you want to protest, you want to go vote. So these things are very helpful for politicians, as opposed to withdrawal emotions like depression and fear, which make us want to go home and put the pillow over our heads um, and, uh, and tend to, 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 to be demobilizing kinds of emotions. So, um, so politicians like Trump, when they, when they take a, a, an issue like immigration and they turn it into something where a, a malevolent foreign government is doing something purposely to hurt us, and hurt people like you, they know what they're doing. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to. Um, uh, what I've, I I want to end some, with some evidence about polarization. So I've been suggesting that the link between populism and democratic erosion is that populists deploy a Manichaean discourse and polarize dis us, uh, us around differences of partisanship, religion, ethnicity, but not so much social class. Um, when their followers see, start to understand that Manichaean discourse and start to uh, uh, view their, uh, the opponents of their leader and themselves as these dangerous threatening forces, um, they are more willing to stomach or to tolerate the erosion of democratic procedures and norms. Um, and that's a point that I think has been made very, very powerfully by my colleague Milan Svolik um, at Yale, who, um, who has explained very clearly and shown evidence that um, other things being equal, the more polarized um, voters are, citizens are, the more they are willing to give up on, on the niceties of democracy um, in order to keep the bad guys out of power. And you can also understand that as a, as a as a kind of dynamic that works at the elite level as well. So the more um, the the leaders of a political party see the opposite the other side as um, as a dangerous threat, the more willing they'll be to tolerate um, to undertake action anti democratic actions and also tolerate them in their in their own leadership. So what I want to um, end with is some evidence of a kind of at least elective affinity um, or association, uh, if, if not a causal connection between polarization, um, this time at the level of, uh, of, um, of political parties and, um, and democratic erosion. Okay, um, so this figure um, is again drawing on uh, data from, from VDEM from varieties of democracy. Um, and it's a measure that um, asks the, their experts to um, tell them to, to evaluate each country in terms of the extent to which political differences affect social relationships beyond political discussions. Um, so societies are highly polarized if supporters of opposing political camps are reluctant to engage in friendly interactions. Um, for example, family functions, civic associations, free time activities, and workplaces. So um, what this figure is showing us is the, um, the proportion of eroding democracies is in red, and the proportion of non-eroding democracies is in blue, and this is according to the levels of political participation. So it shows that um, we, we indeed, indeed see higher levels of polarization in eroding countries. 
Now, this figure might be telling us that um, polar in polarized settings, aspiring autocrats find it easier to get elected and to stay in office. Um, so then polarization encourages erosion, and that's sort of the story that I've been telling. But if polarization is good for aspiring autocrats, for people who are interested in eroding their democracies, then we would also expect these leaders to encourage further polarization. And the, the, the discourses, the, 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 um, the, the snippets that I was showing you from leaders like Trump and, and Orban and, and Modi earlier certainly seem to indicate that they're, they're not just taking advantage of a polarized setting, they're trying to make to, to increase levels of polarization. So in that, so the, the causal arrow might go in the other, other direction or, or might indeed go in, in both directions. Um, and here is just a final uh, sort of piece of evidence to suggest that erosion indeed encourages polarization. So the level of polarization in non-eroding countries, and that's the blue line, the, the bottom line is flat, pretty much flat over time in the first couple Dec in the first few decades of the 20 21st century, but the level of polarization in eroding democracies, and that's the red line, has rising, has risen over time. These are average levels of polarization, political polarization in eroding countries. Okay, to summarize, democratic erosion is the new threat to democracy spreading at the, at the same time that military coups have subsided worldwide. Like earlier forms of democratic instability, um, uh, it has democratic erosion um, is uh, is driven to some degree by income inequality. Um, it's encouraged by a kind of increased levels of income inequality that many regions of the world have experienced going back to the 1970s. With growing inequality, voters are sensitive to discourses of victimhood, to seeing themselves as under assault. Populist leaders take advantage of this sensitivity. Right-wing populists polarize non-class conflict, conflict over identities, um, things like um, ethnicity um, uh, and, uh, and religion. Polarization allows these leaders to attack their democracies their followers tolerate these attacks. The erosion of democracy, they, they, they see it in, in their view, is preferable to the hated other side winning elections and taking over, over government. So thank you very much for your attention and I'd be happy to, to, to take some questions. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for this wonderful lecture. It was a brilliant uh, combination of, you know, this, uh, so many histories, a story about economic inequality, political actors, human emotions and psychology, and all comes together to explain the erosion of democracy. Also, I really appreciated how you mentioned the early uh, uh, career researchers that worked with you. Thank you so much. This is a good uh, inspiration for our own students. I see um, there are, you know, uh, questions are dropping in the Q&A session. I will read them out loud for everyone. But before um, going to the questions from the audience, I would like to ask uh, uh, one question for myself, just you know, for educational purposes. Can you clarify one thing? In the very beginning, you mentioned Russia as a consolidated authoritarian regime. And I know there are so many uh, terms now. People uh, say uh, electoral uh, authoritarian regimes, hybrid regimes, consolidated authoritarian regime. Can you just tell us what is the difference between those? What is consolidated um, uh, authoritarian regime and what Russia is from the perspective of um, contemporary political science? Yeah, no, thank you. That's a great question. So um, I think that the actual phrase consolidated autocracy, it comes from one of these organizations that sort of scores um, countries. Um, and I don't remember off the top of my head if that's Varieties of Democracy or the Economist Intelligence Report or Freedom House. There are a number of organizations that um, gather information about countries and, and sort of score them in, 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 um, in complex ways. In my view, Varieties of Democracy is the, be is the best of them. Um, but that's where that phrase comes from. Um, I, I, I think that the, um, the point that many autocracies um, hold elections is a very important one and sort of goes to the point that I'm trying to underscore that 
there's value in appearing to be a democracy even when you're no, you no longer are. So um, scholars, in particular of the Middle East um, and other other parts of the world, have looked very closely at this question of you know you have author authoritarian regimes, they hold elections, you know, a country like Egypt would be an example. What's the point of holding elections if, or, or in the, an earlier era, Mexico was a country in which elections were held, they looked like real elections, there were campaigns, um, there were, um, uh, there, there, there are campaigns, there are, um, sorry, can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, uh, I am going to make sure that my teenage kids don't call me right now. Uh, they look like real elections. So why bother? Why do you have elections in, in countries where you know, you, in, in the Mexican case, the PRI was going to win no matter what. Um, so, um, th and then there are, you know, military regimes that don't bother to hold elections. They just persist in power, um, you know, for as long as they're, as they're able. Um, so Russia is, 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 uh, you know, a country in which um, it's there's very little mystery about who's going to win elections when they're held. Um, the Russian reg uh, regime has has, um, has has used fraud when when necessary, um, has used all kinds of um, biases in uh, in access to the press. Um, but still, I think there what you're suggesting is there there's there's some there's some space between that and out and out autocracy, um, and maybe the term consolidated autocracy doesn't doesn't really reflect that. Um, so um, it, it, it does, we are in a, in a period of history in which um, countries like to look like democracies and hold elections even when they're not, but that gets you into a gray area. So another good example is Turkey, where um, uh, you know, there has been a steady kind of a, a onslaught against democracy organized by the AKP party um, and, um, and uh, President, Prime Minister, now President Erdogan, um, elections have been losable by the regime, um, but the sense is that there's less and less tolerance. There will be less and less tolerance for loss. So there were municipal elections where the AK, that the AKP lost, and um, wasn't happy with the loss and demanded that they be re reheld. But then when they when they were held again and the opposition won again. The, the ruling party nationally um, accepted those, that outcome. So there's, a, there's still a little space between that and, and consolidated autocracy. So these are clunky terms and <laughs> I kind of agree with the, with the, the message of your question. Yeah, um, thanks. Thanks for still clarifying that. And um, I'm reading now the questions from the audience. Uh, so far we have four questions and uh, two of them are about those exceptions which you mentioned. You mentioned uh, Poland and Hungary as outliers. So the audience is wondering how, what are the you know alternative explanations? Are the types of theories uh, that can be applied to explain these two cases? And one of the members of the audience um, asks a very interesting point. He makes a point that uh, in Poland specifically, those who are in power. Uh, they, on the one hand, they try to polarize society and increase sentiments of xenophobia. At the same time, they're getting heavily into redistribution and extensive welfare. So it seems like they're going um, at the same time to this uh, direction. So it's difficult to classify these two cases. You see them as outliers in your own data. So how can we make sense of what is going on there? Fascinating questions. Thank you so much to the questioner. Um, first thing to say is that when we look at sort of structural um, conditions that that encourage or discourage sort of political events, we're really in the world of multiple sources of causation and probabilistic um, causation. So we don't expect to see um, high levels of income inequality across the board in countries that have experienced erosion. In fact, that figure I showed you in which there were only two outlier cases. I was surprised by that. That's that's really a fairly strong effect. Um, all very preliminary. We still have a lot of work to do to make sure that we're that we're we're measuring these correctly and that they they're 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 in they're infrequent events. So by their very nature, a little bit more difficult to predict. Um, so it's it's not. I don't think it's 
um, destructive of the theory that there are some that there are some outlier outlier cases. There certainly are would be other causes for um, for democratic erosion. Um, second observation, which I sort of hinted at in my uh, my remarks, is that um, I believe that the direction of change in terms of income distribution in the post-communist world has been in the direction of greater income polarization, so greater income inequality, so that even if Poland and Hungary are sort of residually relatively low um, Gini countries, I, my hunch is that they had that Gini indexes have risen quite substantially in the last couple decades. Um, so, so those same kinds of sentiments of um, of resentment um, and of ha being kind of being left behind in a period of economic growth um, might well uh, foster, you know, foster themselves or fester in countries in which they're, they're still relatively uh, equal in international terms, but they look much less equal than they did in an earlier period in that in that country. Think about the wonderful metaphor that Albert Hirschman, uh, the economist, used of the tunnel effect. So he he thought it, he envisioned sitting in a tunnel, two streams of traffic, they're, they're at a halt, they're stopped, um, and you're sitting in one car and you look across at the other lane and the other lane starts moving. And your first reaction might be, oh, great, that means I'm going to be moving soon. But you sit, you, you're you stuck for a long time and the other lane of traffic is moving, you start feeling resentful. Why are they moving and not me? So that's the kind of um, you know, the kind of sense of relative deprivation um, and of being left behind that can happen in a country that is experiencing both economic growth and a decline in income distribution, um, even though income distribution might still be relatively equal in comparative terms. So those are my hunches about, about those countries. Clearly, there are other factors, um, and this may come out in, in other parts of the question and answer, but I would also point to some international influences among, among these countries. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this uh, clarification. And there is another very fascinating question. I find it very interesting that people are, you know, immediately trying to um, apply um, the knowledge from a lecture to um, to what we, should we do in in the current situation. So the question is, um, um, what about restoring democracy in a post-crisis country? How to install an institutional design where state uh, state agencies institutions work effectively in a democratic manner, basically after the war? Uh, how not to pave the way for a democratic erosion? Yes, <laughs> absolutely, the crucial question to be, and I can imagine that those are urgent, urgent questions on the agenda um, in Ukraine. Hopefully, hopefully it'll be in a post-war moment sooner rather than later. Let me just say that in a very different context, we've, we feel the urgency of those questions in my country in the United States. So, um, so I can understand in a very different context, the urgency of those questions. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess answer number one, or first part of the answer is notice the political perils of of inequality, of income inequality. Um, uh, we ha ha went through a long period, we'll kind of loosely call it neoliberalism, in which the assumption was that, that um, deregulation and sort of freeing up market forces um, and um, allowing for high rates of economic growth would, um, you know, rising tide will raise all boats is the metaphor that you hear over and over again in the English speaking world. Um, and, um, and that turns out not to be true. Uh, the when, under unregulated periods of high economic growth, income distribution tends to become worse. Um, and that's a very politically perilous thing to happen because it's exactly for, for the reasons that we're seeing, it encourages um, right-wing populace, it encourages autocratization. Um, it um, therefore encourages war in, you know, in the, in the, the tragic case of, of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, so, we, I think we need policies that deal directly with income distribution. And I think I would go back to the figure that I showed you. I think that the social democratic um, uh, outcome is, the, is one that is um, helpful both for um, its insistence on uh, using government um, policy to reduce income 
um, inequality, but also um, its insistence on the democracy part of it. That is shoring up democratic institutions, um, protecting people, the people's right to vote, um, uh, uh, protecting independent judiciaries, protecting um, the press, um, the independent press. Um, all of these things have co that come under terrible assault by aspiring autocrats. And, um, and Ukraine, I guess, you know, the good news is that Ukraine has, you saw the graph and I've, you know, I'm far from being an expert in, in your part of the world, but it does seem to be a country that um, was struggling toward an improving quality of democracy. I know the problem of corruption has been dire and there, and there have been real efforts in that direction. Obviously, I can't imagine how a war interrupts that kind of process. But um, here in the United States, we are in a moment where we need to reaffirm the importance of an independent civil service, a non-politicized civil service, reject the language of the deep state, reject the language of the press being the enemy of the people. Um, and there's just a long, long agenda of democracy strengthening institutional changes that we have um, very much on our plates here in this country. And I can imagine that that's gonna be a, a very long, um, year long kind of project, years long project in, in Ukraine. Yeah. Interestingly, you also answered another question because uh, uh, one of the uh, members of the audience, Maxim, he also asked about liberal capitalism as the, sort of one of the uh, possible reasons behind inequality, which uh, then brings uh, democratic erosion. And you addressed um, these assumptions in your answer already. So I would like to um, come back to uh, some of my own questions to, to use this privilege uh, of a moderator and maybe I, it will give time to our uh, listeners to prepare more questions for you. So I was wondering, um, you know, you mentioned some, um, in, you introduced you, uh, a review of, of, of this uh, debate in political science. You know, you mentioned uh, uh, Jamoglu, other scholars um, and different theories. And as far as I remember, uh, they also debated uh, whether different types of inequality matters. There was a debate whether uh, inequality should be linear, you know, more inequalities, more changes in regime, or inequality must have some sort of a shape. And uh, at average levels of inequality, uh, regime change is more likely due to some uh, reasons described in, in the literature. So I wonder, to what extent this debate actually matters for your theory? Um, do you really do you actually care about the shape of uh, inequality, uh, level of inequalities? Um, how do you see this? Yeah, um, yeah. So I, uh, great question. I I think the I, I don't have a specific answer to the question about the you know sort of the functional form so is there a you know is there a a, a, a sweet spot an area a, a, a level of inequality that's actually um tolerable and helpful um is there a level of equality that's excessive um i i don't have a good answer to that question um one thing i would mention is that um there are very different, as you say, very different kinds of inequality. Um, Gini looks at income; it doesn't look at wealth. And you know, if you look at wealth inequality, it's 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 generally much 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 greater in uh, certainly in OECD countries in, in the United States, much much greater um, if you look at wealth rather than income. So it's a it's a problematic measure, but I think it's a it's correlated with things that we're interested in because presumably the holders of wealth. Um, not just earners of very high incomes want to protect themselves against um, against a kind of you know high rate of um, of of taxation um, just as uh, in, in the same way. Now, you know, I think there are many very wealthy Americans who are appalled by the developments of um, uh, democratic erosion in our own country and are also appalled by income inequality. I mean, Warren Buffett has, uh, you know, signs on and uh, for, you know, uh, for a, a very social democratic kind of agenda. Um, George Soros is a, is a great example of an international actor who's um, extremely wealthy and, and thinks that the world should not be a place of extreme differences in wealth um, and uh, for the kinds of reasons that, you know, just for economic reasons and, and sort of values, but also if you start looking at political consequences, I think there are more and more reasons to be concerned about that. So um, so, so, no to your first question. It's a great question, but I, have, I, I really haven't thought 
much about it and I and I and I should. The one additional thing I would throw in is that the theories of linking income inequality to autocracy and to um, coup d'etats um, are not uncontroversial. And um, they rely in their most abstract form on fairly, I would say, mechanical ideas of voters um, voting on economic interest alone. Um, and you wouldn't necessarily predict from those theories um, a kind of right-wing populace who are able to garner enormous support um, and then turn around and and institute anti-redistributive policy. So that, that's the model in the United States. So um, th there, you know, I, I think we need more psychology when we talk about voters. I you saw a little bit of that in the talk. Um, uh, a, a, another younger scholar, uh, colleague, former Yale PhD, and I published a book a couple of years ago. Um, his name is um, Salim Erdem Aitach, um, and that's a book called um, Why Bother? And it has to do with uh, participation, with turnout. Actually, the Euromaidan protests in Ukraine make an appearance in, in that book, in that study. And we, ha we found ourselves, we're both sort of soft rational choice type people originally, and we found ourselves having to go very deeply into political psychology, learning a ton about political psychology to try to figure out, you know, how is it that people actually um, think about politics and why do they bother turning out to vote or to going to protest, protests that can be dangerous for them when, um, you know, you wouldn't expect from sort of pure economic interest that they would. Um, yeah, so I don't see any more questions in the chat, so I will uh, perhaps ask the final one, you know, is I know that the story that you told us is very complex and it has so many facets and, you know, I just want to uh, try for fun to try to make a very little summary of your main ideas and if you can just tell me if I got it correct or I got it wrong. So to compare with, um, you know, this famous book by Robinson and Ajimogbo who said that, you know, why nations fail, basically they said that nations fail because of institutions, that if institutions are um, not inclusive, then in the long run nations will fail. And is it correct to say that in your story, uh, a short title of your book could be that nations fail because inequality bring populism. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that I would put the outcome in terms of national failure. I think I'm interested in a more specific political outcome, which is attacks on democratic institutions. Um, that attacks on democratic institutions and the undermining of democracy might then lead to something that we would think of in terms of the, the collapse of the state, national failure, that's indeed a possibility. That's something that many Americans are very concerned about at this moment. Um, but, uh, but yes, in terms of the, 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 the sort of causal framework, I would say that, that uh, it is, there is some, some um, parallel between, between the model that I'm putting forward and, and that focus on, um, on exclusion, institutional exclusion. Mm. Well, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this brilliant lecture. Um, it, oh, give me a second. Uh, uh, okay, well, I think you already covered something. Uh, you know, there are some more questions, but you covered uh, this in your talk. So yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, also, we're running out of time and um, um, we really appreciate your input and your willingness to to support our audience and to indulge us with your lecture we will put it online on youtube and distribute it to so more people can watch it later on their time um and i invite everyone to follow our social media key school of economics and uh, myself timothy brick on facebook and twitter and we will post more announcements about the following lectures because uh, as i mentioned in the beginning this is the second season and we will have more uh, political scientists, economists, and historians uh, talking about important matters in their research in the framework of uh, what is going on uh, today in Ukraine and neighboring countries. So Susan, thank you so much again, and uh, I hope we can see you in person here in Kiev uh, during the peaceful times. Thank you so much. I really, I really am honored by the invitation and we're thinking about you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.